good evening welcome to another episode of stroke rounds number 39 man in barrel over to dr jitin so this is a 60 year old male he has diabetic hypertensive on drugs he has presented with neck pain which started in the interscapular area radiating to the right arm at around 8:30 am in the morning so he went to a orthopedician he took some analgesics and steroid he went home and slept for one hour one hour later when he woke up he had bilateral upper limb weakness so he came to our emergency at around 12:30 pm there was no history of any trauma or neck maneuvering so this was the video when he came in there was bilateral weakness of upper limbs bibrachial weakness around grade 3 in the right upper limb and in the left upper limb there was no facial weakness no dysarthria his lower limb power also was normal so in this setting we were thinking of a stroke we took an brain mri diffusion and adc sequence there was no infarct so we took a spinal cord imaging which showed t2 flare t2 hyper intensity in the cervical region around c4 to c6 we completed a diffusion weighted sequence also so this is a axial cut showing hyper intensity in the t2 images so the conventional diffusion weighted imaging could not show much of diffusion restriction so we took a turbo spin echo sequence of diffusion weighted imaging which is essential in a spinal cord in uh, diffusion weighted imaging because of the artifacts which is very common in the echo planar imaging which is used in brain so always ask for a turbo spin echo sequence diffusion in spinal cord infarcts so there was diffusion in way diffusion restriction in the spinal cord so we completed a ct angiogram to look at the vertebrals the vertebrals was okay ex- except for a few hypoplastic uh, segments so spinal cord vascular anatomy would like to introduce uh, dr jay shankar who has joined us the new fellow in the department of uh, stroke and neuro interventions uh, dr jay shankar will explain more on the spinal cord vascular anatomy so the vascular anatomy of the spinal cord uh, the major radicular artery which uh, contribute to the uh, supply from the anterior uh, spinal artery is the artery of adam hiss it start from t7 to t12 so it covers a major area of the arterial supply of the spinal cord and uh, higher up we have vertebral uh, direct supply from the vertebral arteries through the radicular arteries that is from c1 to t3 so our area of interest will be in the So vertebral arteries that is the reason why we took angio of the vertebral arteries then t3 to t7 it uh, supplied by the left sided intercostal artery and this area is very prone for low perfusion ischemia for example low hypotension and aortic surgeries then uh, when we have uh, ischemia related to artery of adam hiss we will have a large infarct involving t8 to t12 segment and lower part of the spinal cord it is supplied by internal iliac branch and all these arteries will finally supply the anterior spinal artery which uh, supplies almost two third of the anterior half of the spinal cord and briefly about spinal cord ischemia uh, the most common uh, causes for spinal cord ischemia are aortic procedures which contribute around 50 percentage which affects the critical intercostal feeder and it, um, most of the time it affects the high upper thoracic cord then next common is atherosclerotic uh, ischemia contributed out 33 percentage the risk factors will be hypertension diabetes and in imaging evidence of atherosclerosis and uh, the spontaneous uh, aortic cause will be include dissection and atherosclerotic changes directly uh, producing ischemia on the uh, feeders then we uh, uh, in, there can be embolic causes like cardiac embolism then uh, atheroembolism then uh, av malformation can produce di- uh, venous hypertension as well as direct pressure and uh, certain cases will be related to degenerative spinal disease which contribute around 15 16 percentage 
Now, uh, what we have uh, with di disc disease and spinal cord ischemia, uh, if there is disc and osteophytes in the MRI, then canal, canal narrowing and history of sudden motion, there is a very chance that uh, spinal cord will have cord ischemia. And uh, a special uh, kind of uh, uh, scenario where we have a mobilized disc material that is fibrocartilaginous embolism abbreviated as FCE which is a very underdiagnosed uh, phenomenon can cause uh, acute disc uh, uh, associated with acute disc herniation will cause spinal cord ischemia. So uh, similar to this condition that is ischemia near the degenerative spine, uh, spine disease and pain followed by weakness and other sclerotic source is absent. In this case we didn't see any obvious cause of other sclerotic changes in the angiogram and it is closely related to the phenomenon known as uh, surface myelopathy and cervical claudication. Now briefly about imaging, only 25% of, uh, of imaging will be having changes in MRI and we, it is must that we have to include diffusion weighted imaging that too turbo spin echo should be incorporated rather than uh, other uh, DW imaging and uh, we have to use uh, stir imaging also in order to differentiate between other inflammatory condition. Now selling of spinal cord is also seen and uh, enhancement will be typically absent for the first three, three to four days which can be used to differentiate between any inflammatory condition and the pattern of uh, signal changes will be uh, in the sagittal imaging pencil like zone and axial owl size sign that is hyper intensity in the anterior horn cell which is more prone to get ischemia. Now about briefly about management. Now uh, as we all know a common cause of uh, spinal cord ischemia is hypotension. Uh, suppose if the patient is coming in the window period, first we should, should consider IVT just like uh, uh, brain infarct, we should consider intravenous thrombolysis. Now let us see what are the evidence of uh, spinal uh, IV thrombolysis in spinal cord infarct. There are many case reports like uh, we, uh, we have shown like uh, journal of stroke and BMJ case reports. Uh, so many case reports where they have uh, done uh, thrombolysis for spinal cord ischemia and most of the time uh, no much major complication related to hemorrhage, hemorrhage complication is not uh, seen during these uh, case reports. Now what are the take home uh, points? Now if we come across any hyper acute uh, quad quadriparesis or paraparesis or in this case uh, bibrachial weakness if you come across hyperacute onset of weakness you should always consider uh, spinal cord ischemia and for that you have to incorporate diffusion imaging for uh, uh, spinal cord uh, uh, MRI and for diffusion we have to include turbo spin echo the TSC and stir imaging. For, for example, the vertebral adjacent vertebral body in fact will be evident in stir imaging uh, as a uh, marrow edema that also should be incorporated. Now about thrombolysis, it, it is not contraindicated as per uh, these case reports. What is the commonest cause for man in the barrel syndrome? Uh, it is uh, uh, most of the time is related to central cord syndrome. Central cord syndrome, yeah. secondary to flexion hyperextension injury. So this is a very interesting case where the patient presented with a typical man in the barrel syndrome presentation, secondary to cord ischemia. So the take home points are very, very clear. One, like acute stroke in the brain or in the brainstem, in the spinal cord also one should seriously consider, even though it has not come in the guideline, there are many case reports in reputed journals uh, you, regarding the use, successful use of thrombolysis in uh, IV thrombolysis in uh, spinal cord ischemia without much uh, complication or similar to what is seen in the brain. So that should be considered as because many a times the recovery may not be as good as in this particular patient. This patient had a very good improvement in the during the next one week with conventional management but that is something which cannot assure in every patient. So one should always seriously consider the possibility of the option of giving IV thrombolysis. Second is, is there any uh, very, very uh, definite way of differentiating between the uh, embolism of the disc material versus uh, whether it is an arterial embolism? Uh, 
if there is uh, evidence of uh, degenerative spine disease adjacent to the uh, area of ischemia and absence of any other sclerotic changes or uh, hypotension that is the uh, main way and uh, second is if there is any evidence of a herniation of the uh, herniation of the uh, uh, disc into the vertebra uh, which is a common finding in uh, fibrocartilaginous embolism and uh, most of the uh, hundred diagnosed cases is through autopsy reports so and usually there is a precipitating factor by like something like that is why it's called surface uh, myelopathy after some sports compression. compression so that that also should be uh, kept in mind but and in the in the er emergency room it's very difficult to differentiate between whether it's a fibrocartilaginous embolism or a arterial embolism so one should always consider the option of thrombolysis in such a patient that should be considered and the second take home point is as you have rightly mentioned the mr should uh, focus you should focus using the turbo spin echo as well as the stir imaging definitely to see the infarcts much better and always when there is a doubt no keep that thing that the spine or the cervical spine could be the cause of weakness many a times we when the patient comes with an acute weakness in the er we think only of the brain think of the spine also thank you please do share your comments thoughts suggestions and opinions and if you have any more to add to this particular interesting case please do let us know see you with another episode of stroke rounds thank you